Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 205. Slow writing. This vlog comes via request from Libby. Hi Libby. And Libby asked me a question. Why is my writing so slow? So Libby, I want to take your question and transform it into a declaration of fabulousness. I'm going to look at slow writing as a gift, as a capacity to transform research and transform you as a researcher. So we're going to start and have a look at the slow movement, but then we're going to move very strongly into some techniques and strategies to deploy slow writing. How interesting is this? So the vlog this week is paired with our session next week on fast writing. And I'm asked on a daily basis, how can I increase the speed of my writing? Also, how can I increase the speed of my reading? That's in my office every single day. So increasing speed is a really, really urgent issue for many of you. And that's important too. But I wanted these two sessions to come together, slow writing and fast writing. And the reason I want them to talk and dialogue and merge is because I want you to get into a point in your research career where you can choose when slow writing is appropriate for the type of work you are doing and then when you can go full throttle, thanks for playing, into fast writing. But I want you to be able to moderate and mitigate those speeds. You have control of speed rather than desperation or worry or seem to be a deficit. So the argument today really is that if you are doing something conceptually difficult, then obviously slow writing is the way to go. And we're going to talk about particularly some techniques to enable that to move into it with intentionality and also to move out of it when you've finished. So let's start with theories of slowness. What is slow writing and how it involves itself very strongly in this very odd configuration of the slow movement. Now, what I want to talk about is the slow movement and particularly slow food is big. It's big internationally. It's part indeed of popular culture. And this slow movement has infiltrated, quickly actually rather than slowly, has infiltrated an array of areas in our daily life. Significantly though, it hasn't moved very strongly into our universities. And it hasn't moved very strongly into higher degrees. And there are reasons for that. And quite legitimate reasons, really. But the slow movement is an act of resistance. It's also an act of denial. It's an act of denial of speed, of the value of speed, of fast food and accelerated culture. And this is a, a major movement of transformation in the last 40 or so years, because in the last 200, 300 years, particularly through the Industrial Revolution, slowness was a, size, a side of mental weakness, or indeed I'll use the dreadful phrase, mental retardation. Thankfully that phrase is not really with us anymore. But we've now transformed the meaning of slowness from a problem or a weakness and into an attribute of value. There are lots of origins of slowness, this turn to slowness and the slow movement itself. And slow food was where it commenced. So it was about slow food and then it moved into a portfolio of other interests. Slow food began in Italy, I know that's a surprise, by Carlo Petrini in 1986. Important year, that one. The slow food movement now includes over 122 countries and over 800 convivia. That is the individual local manifestations of this organisation. The bulk of which obviously are in, you've guessed it, Italy. The history of the entire slow food movement is tracked in one fascinating book by Carl Hanore. He's a Canadian journalist 
and he wrote a book called, and it's a great book actually, In Praise of Slow, In Praise of Slow, and that book was published in 2004. And he critiques through that book what he describes as, quote, the cult of speed, end of quote. The slow movement has progressed from food now to slow retail, slow cities or sitter slow, slow designs, and the slow society, which argues against mobility and flexibility and globalisation. Okay, now you can see why higher education specifically and education more generally are relatively difficult to incorporate into the slow movement. And I think in universities there are two reasons why incorporating the movement to the slow is quite challenging. And those two movements are digitization and vocationalism. The focus on education since the 1980s really has been about universities creating work ready graduates. That's the language we use. So we have to train you, notice the language, we have to train you rather than educate you and very, very quickly. The whole point is you come into a university, we train you, we graduate you and you get back into the workforce as quickly as possible so you can pay taxes going well. So as you can see, quickness or speed is really valued in education. And also digitization has transformed what we think of as teaching and learning, let alone research. So learning now is about convenience, is about flexibility, student-centeredness. So the goal of higher education is to fit into your lifestyle. So you supposedly as students, you want efficiency. You have the right to determine when you learn, when you do not want to learn, and we have to fit in learning, fit in learning into bite-sized chunks that slot into your work and life balance. So, as you can see, both these ideologies of vocationalism and digitization operate against the principles of the slow movement. The question, therefore, we have to ask, and it's a good one, is why food was the focus and is really the focus of the slow movement. And there are reasons, I think. Food is a substance that we need to keep us alive. It always focuses the mind. And it has two functions in our life. Yes, it gives us nutrition, but it also gives us pleasure. Food is a great metaphor for life. You know the phrases, bread is the staff of life, the milk of human kindness. So different places, different races, different communities, different religions engage with food in different ways. So there's a very strong movement to localism, to regionalism and perhaps national cuisine. But of course in education we're not hugely interested in localism, regionalism and internationalization. We're interested in standards. We're interested in how your degree can move around the world. So if I trained you all, notice the word trained, if I trained you all to have a degree that allows you to work in Adelaide, okay, that's fine. But actually I'm training you so that you can move to Mount Gambier and work, or indeed Shanghai, or London, or Dublin, or New York. So this degree must move. It can't be just a local manifestation, world famous in Adelaide. You have to get this degree and the chances are you will work all over the world. So this PhD must have credibility and it must have value beyond the local. Uh, and as you can see, therefore, the slow movement is a bit counterproductive to what we're doing here. So some of the impact of the slow movement was to wind back the impact of industrialization, particularly on food and clothing. Whereas universities for the last 300 years have been absolutely embedded in the transformations to industrialization. That's what we do. And the economic goals of a nation 
funds and develops the priorities of what we do in a university. So this is this economic priority. So the university in many ways is paid for by the nation state, by taxpayers, and we serve the priorities of a nation state at a particular time. And look, we've gone, that argument's gone a pretty long way now. It's, it's pretty difficult now to argue at all, really, for the social value of education. Very difficult these days to get any sort of cut through for an argument that says, right, well, we educate our citizens so that they can read and write and think and create and contribute to citizenship. People sort of look at you a bit oddly and go, really, but can they get a job? So we, of course, can do everything and contributing to citizenship is important, but that argument is very difficult to make these days. And it's often referred to as soft skills, bless. So as you can see, the slow food movement was founded as a direct critique of fast food. So it was directly, really directly engaging with an anger and aggression towards McDonald's. And the aim was to critique fast food and preserve local cuisine. Slow food, though, is about knowledge. In a lot of my writing, I refer to this as food literacy. And look, the goals of slow food are clear and they're valuable. It's a way to preserve local cuisines, local modes of food production, sustainability, absolutely in favour of that. It's a way to bring back small scale processing. So it's anti-Fordist in its relationship to the production of food. I get that. Small scale smoking of meats, small scale baking. So I'm presenting the slow movement and the slow food movement to you as neutrally as possible. I've critiqued it elsewhere in my writing, can I say. But the only question I'll raise in terms of critiquing it is, think about all the stuff that's going on on the planet right now. Terrorism, post-global financial crisis, the climate emergency, we can just keep listing all the stuff that's going on, xenophobia, all the stuff that's going on on the planet right now. Do you really think that talking about food is the most important thing we need to be doing at this juncture in our history? Maybe you do, that's fine, a lot of people agree with you. But we've also got to ask, say, why after September 11, so many cooking programs suddenly appeared in popular culture? Good question. So while the slow movement enacts its critique of consumerism and shopping, and it's a strong critique, so the slow movement critiques shopping and it critiques consumerism. Sadly, it actions that critique through, you're ahead of me, shopping and consumerism. So finally, the big critique of the slow food movement, which I've made in my life, is it's not actually understanding the context in which fast food is popular the role and the function and the purpose of fast food. You see, eating fast food rather than slow food is not about choice. It's about us understanding as scholars the choice in which those contexts and environments are made. So why are men and women deciding to have a takeaway? We can go, oh, takeaway terrible, or we can actually say, hmm, I wonder why that's an issue for them. So here are some reasons why people eat fast food. They work long hours, they have an irregular strategy, they can't do housework, they haven't got the time to do housework because they're managing two or three jobs, they can't manage the stress of contemporary life, families are much more unstable, all members of a family, particularly parents, are working, so who exactly is preparing these meals, and also work is bleeding into leisure and bleeding into family life in really odd ways. So work now is no longer your clock in and your clock out. It really is 24 seven. So when work is proliferating through your life, being able to spend half an hour or an hour cooking is a privilege that a lot of people simply do not have. So slow food is a privilege. You've got to have the money and you've got to have the time to savour food. And that's something that most of us simply cannot achieve now. Slow food is a form of knowledge. 
and therefore it also is elitist. And we need to recognise too that the slow movement is part of a much wider critique in our culture, that the world is moving too fast and a group of people would like to step off the treadmill, deny modernity, deny industrialisation and therefore we have to recognise as we move into the writing component of this vlog that slow writing is a privilege. It is a privilege, the capacity to slow down because to slow down is an act of power. It involves making choices that most of us don't have. So in Australia right now, and this is intriguing I think, the PhD is described in our national policies as a time-based degree. So what is a PhD? A PhD is a time-based degree. And therefore in a time-based degree, slow writing seems the last thing that you can attempt. It requires a space that none of us really seem to have. So therefore, we have to know when strategically we are going to summon these slow literacies and when they have value and power and yes, even when they are efficient amidst a time-based PhD. So before I move into the literature on slow writing and the slow academy, the slow university, and it is an emerging literature and quite interesting, can I say, very strong. I just wanted to, before we move into the advice, offer two stories from me. So this is the bridge of the song today. Now, as most of you know, I'm just finishing off my 20th book right now and I've produced well over 200 plus refereed articles, book chapters, hundreds upon hundreds of articles of journalism. So yes, I'm an academic, but really I suppose I am a writer. I just happen to have a university job. And I've produced all that writing without a sabbatical ever, without research leave ever. And in fact, for the last 10 years of my academic life, my academic contracts have not had one hour of research time in them. So I've done management leadership contracts, so there is no writing time. There's no research morning I can take. There's no research day. I haven't had a research day in 10 years. And of course, this is the future of higher education and you have to be aware and prepared for this type of contract, yeah? So for me, everything I do now is about efficiency, is about productivity. I only get two hours a day to write and it involves me getting up at 2 a.m. in the morning, okay? So I could hope for inspiration and slow writing, but those days are well past me, okay? I don't have a choice to enact slow writing. But let me tell you about two times in my life when I did enact slow writing, and can I say, I didn't know I did. It was only when I was preparing this vlog for you all that I looked back on my writing career and I realised, wow, there were two times that I did slow writing, even though we didn't have that language to describe it as that at that time. And significantly, these two moments emerged very early in my academic and writing career, not in my PhD. I just had to punch that through. I was in full-time work. I needed to get a PhD finished to get the next job. So I just remotely couldn't use slow writing in my PhD. I needed to punch that out. But very early in my career on book one and book two, I did use it. And can I say, my PhD did not become a book. It became about 13 refereed articles. But that was the time team a long time ago where a PhD would not become a book. Things are different for you now, which is great. Now, this this relationship between slow writing early in my career I think is important for you because I was very young and I was actively trying to create new ways of writing and new ways of thinking about doing research. So I was moving very strongly away from the traditional humanities and the traditional social sciences. As a younger person, I know this will come as a surprise to you, I really liked to create a fair amount of havoc. And so what I was trying to do is create these new types of writing as far away from the traditional humanities as I could emerge into and create what I now describe as post-disciplinarity. I live there. 
Now, book one for me was, and I'm terribly, still terribly proud of it, and it is beautifully written as a first book, can I say, is Tracking the Jack, a retracing of the antipodes. Paul Stock, Harder Paul Stock, uh, one of my former PhD students, helped me design this cover. So we worked with the cover as well. The argument is also on the cover, terrific. So look, it's an interesting book because it argues that the relationship between Australia and New Zealand has been undercooked. And Australia, throughout much of its history, is focused on its relationship with Britain. Similarly, Aotearoa New Zealand is focused on its relationship with Britain, and we've neglected the trans-Tasman neighbours. So it's a good argument. And so I looked at colonialism, biculturalism, multiculturalism, fashion, popular music, popular culture, glams, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So this was a book where I said, I am moving forever away from traditional history and the traditional humanities and into a new disturbing intellectual space. Book one. Now, I didn't have research leave at this time either, so I took my annual leave in December 1998 back to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I did a research trip during my annual leave from Auckland right the way down to Invercargill, and yes, even Stewart Island. And this was the first time I'd returned to Aotearoa, New Zealand since I did my first full-time lectureship there about three years earlier. So, as a young woman, I was returning to a former home that was no longer my home. And in the three years since I'd left Wellington, my life had changed radically, and not necessarily for the better. A lot of really terrible things had happened in those three years. So as I walked up from the Victoria University up to my former cellar flat in Kelvin, those of you that know that walk, it's a great walk, I did the walk to visit my former house and I'd found that it had been demolished. So I'd looked for my former place, my former home, and it was gone. So many of the memories of my life that had changed my life happened in that cellar flat and they now appeared to have just vanquished, gone. There was nothing left. Now, it's pretty emotional, getting pretty emotional now, pretty emotional. And as I walked back down that hill from Kelvin, I just sort of stopped and sat on the side of the road on this enormous rock. And I pulled out a notebook, because obviously I was on a research trip, so I pulled out my notebook and just started to quietly write. And I wrote two paragraphs, and those two paragraphs became the hook of the popular music chapter in this book. But further, they became the hook for a lot of the rest of my research life. I mean, I finished a, an article on Bob Dylan last week that still used the ideas that came to me in that emotional state on the side of a, of a sidewalk uh, in Kelvin. And I'll just read you a portion of those paragraphs. Quote, there is a physicality to Wellington of sweat trickling down our back as we walk from Oriental Bay to Kelvin. There's an intense sadness involved in returning to places that were once home. This pain does not involve a loss of place, but a loss of time. The space between a tourist and a resident is occupied by those of us who were long time visitors to a place and then decided to leave. I used to live in Wellington, 43A Central Terrace, Kelvin. So much happened in this house, in this street, in this city. So very little is recorded of those experiences and nothing is left to show that I ever lived there. No trace remains of my washing on the clothesline or my shadow staring at the city in the early morning. These experiences continue to dwell in the popular music of that time. The joy and the sorrow still dwells in that landscape on the returned journey. We can return to the memory by coming back and visiting it. 
the ghosts speak to us loudly at times but we cannot translate their words they speak a different language the language of the past end of quote never wrote two paragraphs like that before or indeed again and obviously I was in absolute tears I was an absolute mess writing this on this rock in Kelvin but can I say it was written slowly and carefully unlike me not a word of those paragraphs was changed or drafted and it became the hook into the popular music work that I did in this book and it became the hook for a large chunk of my entire research career in popular memory study so slow writing is contextual, deep, unusual, almost a bit spooky. And it can create a bit of prose, an idea that can become a pivot of your career. Now similarly my second book, Ladies Who Lunge, was the first time I experimented with comedic writing. Historians are not a funny group of people, can I say. It's not really comedy in history a lot of the time. And so what I wanted to try and do is I wrote a feminist book at a time when feminism was terribly volatile and a bit messed up, is I wanted to write a feminist book that was funny. And in my introduction, which was titled Find a Good Woman and Do As You're Told, I started with my relatively oft quoted sentence, quote, frequently I hate myself for being a heterosexual woman, end of quote. But this experimentation in style, in prose, in form, agitated against what was seen to be academic writing. And it laughed at the nature of life, it laughed at the nature of politics, and it showed the profound comedy involved in being uh, an Australian woman. And it is incredibly funny being an Australian woman walking through the mediocrity and the mansplaining of daily life. So for me, this free writing that I was able to do in Ladies Who Lunge was rare for an academic and I learnt how to write comedically in prose as an academic. So I was finding new spaces to talk about feminism through popular culture. So as you can see, the point I'm making is for this type of experimental writing, the old rules don't really apply. Efficiency, productivity, not going to work here. And significantly for me, and this is where it might help you, this was a pivotal point of my entire career, let alone life. And my research changed through these books. I became a different type of academic. So therefore, these stories are a way to quickly introduce you, ironically, to slow writing. So let's have a look at the literature and explore 10 reasons for you today, tomorrow, five years, 10 years, first book, last book, to use slow writing. Why do it? One, reflection and improvement of your writing. So Maggie Berg and Barbara Sieber in The Slow Professor, a book I can really recommend to you, argue that slow writing is a way for you to recognize the complexity of your life and your writing in it. So it allows all of us and all the disciplines to think about the process of writing. So if you are attempting to work out what you think about a particular topic, then slowing down your writing, allowing the reflection and the interpretation to emerge, to occupy your space and time, allows your arguments and your writing to improve. Because you see, if we write as we've always written, then we don't improve. There's no algorithm, there's no way to improve. Writing at speed means that we're not thinking about it. We write as we've always written. Two, slow writing allows you to think about your identity as an academic and as a researcher. In our accelerated, corporatized universities, we rarely have opportunities to think about who we are or why we do what we do. So much of our scholarly history was about courage, was about forging our own path. The great scholars in the world are courageous, were courageous, and build their own journey their own vista. But the nature of the accelerated university is we get on that treadmill or hamster's wheel if I'm being cruel and we don't think too much at all about who we are or indeed where we are going because we're making a living. 
So slow writing allows us to connect who we are with what we're researching with how we are writing about it. Now, can I say, it would be absolutely debilitating to do this all the time. Oh, let me just reflect. Let me just reflect. You've got to have a body of work. Work out who you are. You've got to have a body of work before you can reflect on it. So if you're reflecting as you go, have a body of work, then implement the slow writing protocols. But I think there is advantages in working hard and then reflecting on your positioning in research, in teaching, in education, in your career. Three, slow writing increases your resilience. Now most of you know I have a lot of problems with the word resilience. I did three vlogs about what I think is wrong with the word resilience. So the idea that I've used it today makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and the reason the word makes me uncomfortable is it's individualizing the capacity to manage something. So as an individual we can manage an event, a person or a behavior. So this is not at all about an individual. So if we can all be just more resilient, then we can manage injustice or inequality. How about we manage the injustice or the inequality? How about we address that rather than just work on how some poor person is going to manage that injustice? Let's address the injustice, not strengthen you up, girlfriend, so that you can manage it. But let's park that for a moment before I have a heart attack. So slow writing allows you to gain confidence, allows you to gain confidence to see your development and see your achievements. And this means you start to become less reliant on what other people think of you and their critiques of your writing. So it means you can approach any referee, any examiner, any critique with confidence. Now I've often defined life as managing disappointments. Successful writing is about managing failure, and it's also negotiating your way through critique and yet continuing to write. Four, why do you slow writing? Four, you become a time lord. Sadly, I'm using this metaphorically. I wish I wasn't. But what slow writing does, and this is crucial as I've got older, to be honest with you, is there's a recognition that academic life has multiple clocks in it, multiple temporalities within it, rather than just one. You see, there is a teaching timetable, you have administrative responsibilities, grant deadlines, writing deadlines, right? And all those clocks are actually different. But being able to create the space to understand the different time zones of academic life is incredibly useful. It means that with reflection, you can understand the timelines in your university and not just move full throttle with efficiency, with productivity, doesn't matter what you're doing, you do it at the same speed. Think about it differently. Five, you recognize and remember the errors, the flaws, and the failures. Our CV never records the detours, the failures, the errors, the mistakes. Our CV never records the projects that sort of went nowhere. But if you don't recognise, in close to as real time as you can, the mistakes and the errors, you will continue to repeat them. So firstly, as I always say, put the problem into the work. So if something goes wrong, an error, a mistake, a flaw, take a breath, log that as an error, a mistake or a flaw and then explore how that error or flaw improves your research right through that problem. And also, can I say, if you recognize those flaws or issues, it improves your career. So when stuff goes wrong, you need to take a breath and you need to recognize it, call it, label it, put it into language. And look, our university systems, at the moment particularly, endlessly celebrate success and achievements. And look, that's okay. But every now and again in a university, you get a sense that, wow, we're celebrating somebody opening an envelope. Wow, isn't that, it took dexterity, yeah, rock and roll. Our whole culture is about sort of, you know, celebrating these micro successes. Oh, that's good, yeah, rock and roll. But actually, we need to recognize as scholars that we improve our understanding, we improve as a scholar, we improve as a person, when we celebrate the mistakes. 
So slow writing allows you to process and log these times and interpret them in a way that enhances your research and your career. So a mistake, an error, a failure is simply a mistake, a mistake, an error or a failure. So we need to acknowledge it, learn from it, but also write about it and it will transform your research, I promise you. Six, crucial one, considered engagement with difficult material. Libby, this one is particularly for you, my love. This is, this is why I want you to just sit in the slow writing and enjoy it. Louise de Salvo, in her book, The Art of Slow Writing, which again, I recommend to you, it's a good book, confirmed that slow writing is the only way to process and to manage difficult material. Now, Libby is working <laughs> in post-colonial theory. If discussions of race in Australia are not difficult, are not complex, are not heavily weighted by angst, then you're not doing it properly. So Libby, keep going. Really difficult research takes time and precision is required. Seven, slow writing allows you to take risks. Sometimes in our lives, in our careers, we need to find some courage. We need to find some courage. And we need to take a leap in our intellectual lives. We don't know where it's gonna go. And look, it takes incredible courage to step outside of the crowd, step outside of your discipline and do something new. So slow writing allows you to take on something important, to make an argument rather than assume an argument. And if you're going to do something courageous, you're going to need some time. You're going to have to make that case with care, with rigour and with precision. This is slow and careful work. So work with every step of that research. Eight. Remember a PhD is research and not an email. Can I say, I also write emails incredibly carefully and slowly. I always assume every email I write uh, could end up in a court, of, a court of law. So that focuses the mind, really. So I'm very careful in the emails that I write. But one consequence of email, I think, is because of the speed of its delivery, like in comes another one, bang, bang, in, out, in, out, in, out, is that writing is transformed. It seemed to be this immediate thing. And perhaps we're way too flippant about it. Text messages are another great example. In it comes, out it goes, in, out, in, out, right? So I'm stunned by what people put in emails. I'm stunned with what people put in text messages. And I think because of the, the speed, there, there's a lack of thinking involved. And it allows emotion, a reflex response, to substitute for thought and emotion. So in our accelerated and digitized university environment, we have to know how and when to move between the speeds of writing. And we have to recognize that what applies in text messaging or emails is not a model for our research. Work on different modes of writing. Nine, creating a scholarly space. So much of the attention in our contemporary university is about how we prepare students for industry. And I have no worry about that. That's great and that's important. Can I say I define, define industry a little bit more generally than some policy documents at the moment. But it is a cliche, I think, that you know, universities prepare students for industry. We need to recognise, firstly, the diversity of industries that exist, particularly when we're dealing with education and health, which are very, very large components of our economy. But also, the endless propulsion to vocationalism and it means what made a university special what made a university spectacular through our history is being lost we're one of the few professions in the world where we're paid 
to think. And that's why, by the way, I spend so much time focusing on dissemination of your ideas, because the taxpayer pays us to think what a privilege that is. And our responsibility, therefore, is to take and use that time and make sure that those ideas are shared in a way that if citizens choose, they can access it. But the point is, our universities are not the banking sector. Our priorities are different. And so therefore we must never forget about the privilege of writing, the incredible privilege of expressing our ideas. So slow writing is a reminder that a university is a place apart. It's a different space in our society. It's a different space in our economy. We are different. And this precious time in a PhD should be used to create different and defiant knowledge. 10. Slow writing keeps us honest. Slow writing requires time and it demands that we make the most of that time. It keeps us honest because we have to start creating precious time, precious writing time. So that means we have to get the rest of our life in order. We have to say no a lot. We have to stay on task. We have to remove distractions and yes, we have to focus. So slow writing reminds us that thinking is a gift. Writing is a gift and it's not slammed into the available space of what happens when everything else is done. So, oh, that's writing time, because everything else has been done at this point. Anyone can write. Very few people can improve their writing, and even fewer people can reshape their entire life to be able to nest some writing in it. You see, the best writers write every day, and we all know that most writing most of the time is pedestrian, pretty basic, pretty boring. But we also know in academic life that we never see first drafts. So I think that's part of what happens to you as students. You're judging your first draft against the polished scholarship that's occurred, occurred through peer review. So you're assessing your first draft against fully drafted material. So no wonder you're feeling a bit weird. So I think slow writing allows us to reflect on writing. So every time you write, every time you write, you're making choices. You're making decisions. And a finished PhD is not about intelligence or talent. It's about stamina. Understanding how to mobilize different types of writing for different times and different tasks. So in many ways, slow writing is like the slow movement because it reminds us of our intellectual history. It focuses on the individual and the individual's research. It allows us to improve, to manage critique, to manage criticism. It also allows us to appreciate the incredible gifts that we have been given. But it also allows us at different points, particularly of a PhD, to say, you know what, this is a difficult moment. I've done all the low hanging fruit, I've done all the easy stuff, and you know what, this is hard yakka. And it's going to be slow, but one word at a time, I'm going to get there. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.